We are in a Prophecy 401 series, and we left off last week with the Lamb opening the first of the seven seals that are upon that scroll in Revelation. That was in chapter 6, the first two verses. And that led the opening of the first seal to what seemed to be an introduction to the figure commonly known as the Antichrist. Paul, as you can see, called him the man of lawlessness in Thessalonians. And we concluded that the opening of these seals and the writing on the scroll is revealing what must take place later or after this in the name of Jesus' words in Revelation 4, 1. So if the seals... And the scroll reveal what is to take place later, meaning still later, later than our day, coming in the future. If that's true, then it might benefit us sitting where we are now in the time we are now to figure out what it is that he's uncovering to us, what he's revealing to us about what may yet what will yet come. Let me suggest to you there's a pretty easy, pretty clear way to figure out what is being revealed. <clears throat> and that is to lay down the opening of the seals on the scroll in Revelation chapter 6 with Jesus' Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. I'll keep a running total of the seals up on the screen here so that we can keep track of where we are as best as possible. So let's start there in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away from the temple when the disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. It was a magnificent, grand structure. Just know that. It was incredible. Huge. Stories and stories high. Huge walls. Beautiful architecture. You see the beauty of these, these buildings. But Jesus said in verse 2, You see all of these? Don't you? Do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So Jesus is talking about what? The destruction of that great and beautiful house of God, the temple. And then in verse 3, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives after revealing that to his disciples... Those disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things be? What you talked about with those stones being thrown down. And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So we can see at least a part of the question is, Hey Jesus, what's it going to be like when you come again? And what's Revelation answering? What it's going to be like when he comes again. It's the same context for both. And so we would expect the same description. And I believe you will not be disappointed. So let's see what Jesus says. We'll start with seal number one. It seems the result will be false Christs. We'll start with the seals each time. And seal number one at its breaking was false Christs. Look at chapter 6 of Revelation, the first two verses. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked and behold a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. If you remember, this was last week's message, so we'll not go into it in depth. You can refer to that message last week. But we talked about this imposter, this imitator of Jesus, 
Jesus will come in Matthew 9, or Revelation 19 riding on a white horse to conquer. And so that's why this imitator, this imposter, this false Christ is doing the same thing here. How do we know it's him as a false one, a false Messiah, a false Christ? Well, go back to Matthew 24 and look at verses 4 and 5. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, Jesus answered them, beginning his answer, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. So you can see the breaking of that seal reveals false Christ. So does Jesus' Olivet Discourse. False Christ, seal number one. Now let's go to seal number two. Back to Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. The second seal. When he opened the second seal, Revelation 6, 3, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted, here's what's happening, to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. What does that sound like? Sounds like warring, doesn't it? Taking peace from the earth and slaying one another. So what should we expect to find back in Matthew 24? You can look up here, verse 6 and the beginning of verse 7 in Matthew 24. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. But Jesus says, the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Let's go to seal number three, back in Revelation chapter six. What do we find with seal number three? Famine. Revelation six, verse five. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider hell, hell had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, Here's how we figure out it's a famine. A quart of wheat for a denarius. So imagine a dry measure the size of a quart. And put wheat in that. How much would that cost us? Well, a denarius in that day was a day's wage. So let's say that among us, the most humble would make a hundred bucks a day. Some of you may make 200 bucks a day. So you're talking about a quart of wheat for a hundred to two hundred dollars. Pretty expensive. Why might it be expensive? Because there's not much. When supply goes down, cost goes up. And also three quarts of barley for a denarius and don't harm the oil and the wine. So cost is going up for goods because they're scarce. How do we know that? Well, go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, continuing in verse 7, and there will be, what's it say? Anybody out there? Famines. Famines. And there will be famines and earthquakes, right? And now let's go back to seal number four. Revelation chapter six, verse seven. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and its rider was death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. And so now the breaking of seal number four reveals that death is going to come upon the earth. We saw the famines, we've seen the earthquakes, and now a new mention is the pestilences. Death by pestilences. Now, Matthew's account doesn't share this with us, but Luke, in his account, that is a mirror image of it, does. You can see it up here on the screen from Luke chapter 21, verse 11, where he writes, There'll be earthquakes, and in various places, famines and pestilences. The very same thing we see in Revelation, and there'll be terrors and great signs from heaven. So with the first four seals, we can go back to those, we see false Christs, wars, 
famines and death by pestilences. Things are getting serious upon this earth, but they're about to turn from bad to worse. Because when we get to seal number five in Revelation chapter six, where in verse nine, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Why? For the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. That is, those who were to be killed as they themselves had be. So at seal number five, we see not just false messiahs, false Christ, wars and famines and plagues, but now we see outright martyrdom. How long, O oh Lord, will you avenge our blood? Those who had been slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, that man of lawlessness, that antichrist, that imposter, is going to impose his death sentence upon those who worship God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's what's coming upon this earth. Now, can we reinforce that with Matthew? We'll go back to Matthew 24. We're in verse 9 of that as well. Matthew 24. He expounds on this through a lot of Matthew 24 because this is where it gets serious. So let's start in Matthew 24, 9. It says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. What did we just see at the breaking of the fifth seal? Martyrdom. Death. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. We saw that last week with this false Messiah, this false prophet coming up, the two of them. In verse 12, because of lawlessness and its increase, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So, verse 15, he continues on this same theme with what's happening with the fifth seal. seal. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what's in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, it will be terrible. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then, in this time... Coming upon the world, there will be great tribulation. How great? Such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, and no, never will be again. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise, perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, verse 25, I've told you beforehand... 
So if they say to you, look, here he is in the wilderness, don't go out. If they say, look, here he is in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. This fifth seal is revealing a great unequaled tribulation that is coming upon this world at the hand of this man of lawlessness, this Antichrist, and comes upon the world. And it is going to be a time of martyrdom. For those that hold to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, it is such a severe time of persecution that no human would survive unless God called an end to it before he was done executing it. That's the only way anyone is going to survive. It's a gruesome, horrible time, but Jesus says, I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you can know what is coming. We spoke last week that the false antichrist would make war on the saints and conquer them. Here it is. You can see it from Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. And it, that beast, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Now keep in mind, church, and this is certainly what we see in both accounts, that faith in the one true God and the testimony of His Son, listen to me, throughout history, faith in God and the testimony of His Son has drained the blood of many a martyr throughout history. So you might be saying, why? Why would God allow such a thing as has been described here clearly in Revelation 6 and clearly in Matthew 24 with the killing of Christians? Why would He allow it like that? And if we ask that question, why He would allow it like that now, here, today, in this day, we've got to allow this question. Why would He then ever allow it? But he has. Throughout history, many, many, and many more Christians have died for their faith in God and the testimony of Jesus. We are not special to avoid it. It is what makes us special in that we do not love our lives even unto death. That our faith means so much to us that we are willing to go knowing that death is a temporary, momentary state until we are ushered in the presence of the one who has purchased us for life. Amen. So keep in mind, church, that when you are told, we'll be out of here, will be raptured up and away before things get serious. It's not what we've read, and it doesn't fit the precedent of God who, who allows His people to experience suffering and hardship unto His glory. And the key question is this. Here's the key question. Whose wrath is on display? It's not God's. It is, as you can see, you said it, here it is, Satan's wrath is on display. This is not God wanting to put his people to death. This is Satan wanting to make war against those who hold to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It's not yet God's wrath. We'll see it here in just a minute or two. We'll see God's wrath, but this is Satan's wrath. 
Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, you can see it up here on the screen, says, Then the dragon, that's Satan, he became furious with the woman, Israel, who gives birth to the male offspring, who is Jesus, and he goes off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who's that? It says, He's making war on those who keep the commands of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. It can't be any clearer than that. And Satan has given his power to this evil man to come upon this earth to accomplish it. Revelation 13, 4, And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? But church, even in the darkest times, even when the martyrs are crying out, Oh God, how long until you avenge our blood? How long, God, are you going to allow this slaughter of Christians to go on? And they're told to wait a little longer until what? Not until he stops it, but until the full number of Christians are to die. A few more have to die for their faith in Jesus Christ. But even in the darkest night, the dawn still comes. And the morning star arises. And so we go to seal number 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 and following. And when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And here are the key phrases. The sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. And the sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Now, what do you think Matthew says about that? Go over to Matthew 24, verse 29 is where we left off. Immediately, Matthew 24, 29. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. What does this sign reveal when the sun is dark and the moon does not give its light and the stars fall from the sky? We saw it in Revelation 6. We see it in Matthew 24. What's this revealing? It's revealing, it's indicating that the day of the Lord is imminent. That's what it's revealing. That's what we're seeing now, is that Satan, the evil man, the man of lawlessness have had their day, but now the day of the Lord is imminent. And Joel chapter 2 verse 31, as you see it up here, says that the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it is a day of wrath. The wrath of God. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day. Notice the mighty man cries aloud. Why? Because he is terrified of what is coming when Jesus returns. And so what is their response? Revelation chapter 6. Let's keep reading. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 is where we left off. The response... Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? 
What is the response of the sun and the moon and the stars and the seeing Jesus in the sky? Oh my, I think we're in a bit of trouble here. And that's what Matthew says as well. Go back to Matthew 24, verse 30. Matthew 24, 30, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Understand that response is paralleled in Luke chapter 21. Now what's happening here? Times are changing. Things are changing. Jesus is stepping back in to time when the man of evil, the wicked man, has had his day. And Jesus steps in and all of those who join him are in fear and terror because of the coming of Jesus. And I want you to look at Luke chapter 21 up here on the screen when it says there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on earth the stressing of the nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves and people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So the day of the Lord has come. And along with that, His wrath. But, but before, before His wrath is poured out upon the earth, there are two events that act as an interlude in chapter 7. Because we don't get to the seventh seal in chapter 8 until 8. So it's a pause, if you will. The sign of His coming has happened. The sun, moon, and stars, they've seen Jesus. They've become afraid. Oh no, His wrath is here. But two things have to happen before that happens. His wrath. And that is, number one, as you can see it up here on the screen, before His wrath, He seals the 144,000. That's chapter 7 of Revelation, the first eight verses. We're not going to read that because we'll talk about that next time. But chapter 7, the first eight verses, is the sealing of the 144,000. That's the first act before the wrath. And the second act, as you can see it up here, is this, and it's important. He's got to get the church out of the way. Those that are left, those that have made it through the martyrdom, have to be taken out of the way before the wrath of God and the Lamb have come. And that is chapter 7, starting in verse 9 and following. Let's look at it together. Please stay with me. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, all the tribes, all the peoples, and all the languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let it be. And then one of the elders addressed me, John, who's writing this, saying, Who are these? Who's this multitude that no one can count from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language? Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And John responds, Sir, you know. And so he said to John, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, verse 15, they're before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They'll not hunger anymore. They won't thirst anymore. The sun will not strike them anymore, nor the scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, that pause has to happen 
for God's church to be rescued out of the way of His wrath. But after that, then the day of the Lord's wrath is poured out in chapter 8. The last seal, as you can see it up here on the screen. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Why? We'll talk about it. But I believe the silence is because things are going to get really serious. And I saw the seven angels who were standing before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with the golden censer. And it was given much incense to offer the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of their prayers rose before God from the hand of the angel. And then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire and the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And verse 6, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets, which are the wrath of God, which we will see coming up in this series, prepared to blow them. This is the same thing that we find in Matthew chapter 24, where after the rescue, we see the wrath. Go back to Matthew 24. We're getting the church out of the way. Verse 30 Matthew 24, 30, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. They'll see Him coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Verse 31, And He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet call to gather His elect from the four winds to get the church out of the way from one end of heaven to the other. And then He gives a lesson on a fig tree. And then in verse 36, no one knows exactly the day or the hour, but verse 37 of Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days of the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, thinking everything was going to continue until the day Noah entered the ark. They were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. It is rescue... And then wrath. Rescuing the church and then the wrath of God being poured out on the earth, which we will get into. Let me conclude. All seven seals have been broken. And the contents of the scroll can now be revealed, read. And the contents... Reveal that God has decided to exact His vengeance upon those who remain on the earth. But keep in mind, church, that before God's wrath comes, not before Satan's, but before God's wrath, which is much greater, God has gathered those that belong to Him up and out of the way. Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, that we are waiting for His Son from heaven, what we just saw, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. God's the wrath of the Lamb. But here's my concern, church, and with it I'll close. Paul talked about the burden that he carries for the church, the churches. And my concern... My burden concerning the church is that great falling away that Jesus spoke of. I fear that American cultural Christianity, some of you, some of you, that I want to call my brothers and sisters in Christ, that when that man of lawlessness, that wicked man, shows up and starts demanding allegiance and worship, starving us out without the ability to buy and sell, I fear that those I want to call my brothers and sisters in Christ will instead sell their soul for a false security. 
Or the church has so often heard that when things get bad, he'll get us out of the way before any great tribulation happens upon this earth. That when this period of unequal distress comes upon the world, a good number of Christians will feel abandoned and betrayed by God. And thus they will fall away when he doesn't rescue them. It grieves me. It concerns me. I know it is the predominant story in the church of Jesus Christ that if these things, as told, happen as they are, that the church is caught away in some secret rapture before the man of lawlessness, before the tribulation, but we've laid them down side by side, and we see that the rescue only comes before the wrath of God, not before the wrath of Satan. And I want little more than to prepare you, to prepare the church the mind of the church for such a time. And that's why we'll go back to chapter 7 next time. But suffice it to say for this day that the wickedness that is coming upon this world someday, like never before, and the persecution that is coming upon this world like never before, and the martyrdom that is coming upon this world like never before, when it comes, just as John fell down at the feet of the glorified Jesus and Jesus put his hand upon him and said, John, do not fear. I was dead, might I add, too, but I am alive forevermore. That same Jesus rests his hand upon his Christians, his believers, his followers, the church of Jesus Christ. And he says, don't fear. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I am the living one and I'm with my people in life as I am with them in death. And he will not leave us nor forsake us even unto death. I think that when we lay the seals of the scroll down next to Matthew 24, it's really not so hard to understand. It's just hard to accept. But if we do accept it and try not to logic it away, we have been warned. Jesus said, I have told you ahead of time. And knowing is the first step in preparing. Preparing my heart. Preparing my mind. Preparing my family and their faith. And preparing with each other. For the promise stands true. The one that endures to the end will be saved. Let's pray.